views expressed on this program are those of the hosts, guests, and callers, and are not necessarily those of this station, its management, or other advertisers. You're listening to Transformation Talk Radio. Get fired up for Spirit Fire Radio with your hosts, Dorothy Riddle and Steve Kramer. Get ready to shine the light on universal spiritual principles and uncover ways that ageless wisdom can guide you in cultivating consciousness in these modern times. Bring purpose to your life through practical spirituality and add to your awareness with Spirit Fire Radio. Now, here are your hosts, Dorothy Riddle and Steve Kramer. Hello, listeners. Welcome to Spirit Fire Radio. It is a delight to be with you. I am joined by my co-host, Dr. Dorothy Riddle. Hi, Dorothy. Hi, Steve. Great to be with you. Well, listeners, it couldn't be a more apropos theme for August. We are talking about compassion for the rest of the month, and it seems that we all have been contemplating this word in the events of the last few weeks. What is compassion? How do we generate it? What gets in the way of our generating compassion and why can that be so complicated? That's what we are going to talk about today. Before we do that, Dorothy, let's just uh, tell our listeners a little bit about our organizations. So Spirify Radio is a collaboration between two nonprofit educational organizations and my half is Spirit Fire, and we are an educational nonprofit dedicated to teaching people the importance of spirituality and trying to show them ways that they can integrate that into their everyday lives. We do that through retreats and online programming and our own meditation practice called The Practice of Living Awareness. And you can find out more about that at spiritfire.com. And Dorothy? And I am with the School for Esoteric Studies. Uh, you can find out about us at esotericstudies.net. We are very excited about this collaboration because we purposely went looking for organizations to work with, uh, having been aware that, unfortunately, many groups kind of compete with each other. So we were absolutely delighted. Uh, we, our focus is on esoteric discipleship training, uh, helping persons with a spiritual practice to deepen that practice and uh, to, uh, be, to become or act as world servers. And we do that through meditation, study, and service. So it's wonderful to be back with you again, Steve, this week. And I really look forward to our conversation on why it's challenging to be compassionate. Well, absolutely. It seems like we've all been sort of pondering that this week. You know, the, we survived these huge uh, sort of astrological planetary uh, events. We'd survived the planetary alignment. We survived the new millennium, 1999, went into 2000. We're still here, right? The solar eclipse, 2012. And we get back to life as it is. And when we take a look sometimes at life as it is, it's not always the most pretty picture. Or we realize that there can be suffering and that we are in this together, right, Dorothy? Or we would hope that yeah. we all on some level have an understanding that we're in this together and we can rely on each other, which is at the core of compassion. Yeah. And I have a, a quote for us, Steve. Beautiful. This quote is from Albert Einstein, and he said, Our task must be to free ourselves by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature and its beauty. And I'd like to link that, Steve, to one of the principles that we've talked about before uh, and that I've written about in my book, uh, Principles of Abundance for the Cosmic Citizen, and that is interconnectivity, that we are indeed all part of the same cosmic energy field. We are all connected. What we do, how we feel, how we think affects one another. And part of the challenge is to remember that because when we forget it, 
that's when we start to act out of self-interest rather than compassion. Indeed. And I love, I love the heart quality of that quote, right? We think of Albert Einstein as, as being this purely scientific genius, you know, and he's talking about widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature, right? And it's beauty. They're, they're words we wouldn't, I don't know, the average person might not associate with Albert Einstein, but it shows, you know, the wisdom behind understanding that interconnection and understanding that it goes well beyond, uh, it can go well beyond, um, you know, our immediate circle that we need to widen it and include include all living thing. I think that's a key, right? As far as I'm concerned, that widening the circle is so imperative when it comes to compassion because uh, it helps us understand that variety and diversity, you know, are not really a scary thing, but it is something to embrace and that actually can be wondrous to, you know, behold all of all of the differences amongst us and and know that we're connected so that we can relate and help each other in times of need. Yes, absolutely. And uh, I would just like to comment that uh, for those of our listeners that are um, involved in spiritual studies uh, that read uh, from books like the Blue Books of the Tibetan and Alice Bailey, the, there's a lot of emphasis on, in all of the metaphysical literature, actually, on what you might think of as vertical expansion, you know, our, our um, connecting up with our soul, uh, with other parts of, this, of the spiritual uh, realm or spiritual universe. And we forget that we're not in a linear environment. We're in more of a spherical environment. And so horizontal expansion is as important as that vertical expansion. In fact, uh, some of the teachers, the esoteric teachers, talk specifically about that, about the importance of widening our horizontal circle to be much more inclusive beyond just the people that we know well that we feel comfortable with our in group so to speak, and maybe some acquaintances, but to, to recognize that it actually includes everyone, which, inc- which means it also includes some people that maybe we're not very happy with or we don't like all that much. Indeed. You, and you said, you know, last week that, that without love and compassion, this was a, it was from the Dalai Lama, I believe, that, that humanity cannot survive. And so that horizontal is really coming to understand the human experience of the here and now of our, our fellow beings, not only human, but really the, the whole world and all of nature, which is what Einstein was saying. Yeah, indeed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we often forget, Steve, that, uh, you know, when we, we talk about global warming, we talk about uh, environmental impact, uh, we forget that actually the earth, which is itself, a sentient being, a self-managed being, uh, has the ability to survive just fine without us. We're <laughs> the ones that need the earth. Yes. We're the ones that need the other species. Uh, and uh, we're, we're not the emperor, so to speak. We're not the, the one that controls everything. Right, so it's imperative, <laughs> just at first glance, that we first get along, right? That that mm-hmm. we talked a bit about Darwin last week, you know, that, that we have sympathy, that actually we tap into this innate quality within us, which is that of being sympathetic, of, of wanting or feeling good about helping another. And uh, it seems at times we, we don't take refuge in that instinct. It's almost as if we've unlearned it in some instances. That, that's true. And just for, the, for those of our listeners that weren't with us last week, Steve, let's just mention that uh, the – while we get caught often that what Darwin uh, said was survival of the fittest, what he really wrote was survival of the kind of kindness. That it was kindness, uh, which is very closely connected to compassion, that is what would allow us to survive. Yes, and very interesting in that note that it was, you know. 
animals and communities and groups that aid and defend one another, that natural selection will see to it that those that have the most sympathy will flourish best. And, you know, mm. they raise the strongest and more, most sympathetic offspring and those that are wanting to cooperate. So again, it comes back to once again, cooperation versus competition. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, there just a, in just a bit of the news this week, you know, I just have to say, I, the last week, rather, uh, I was so moved by, um, after the horrible events in Barcelona, there was a coworker of one of the young men who passed, who was offering a tribute to him. And, uh, he was saying that, that he and his kids were on a trip and, and they were blogging about it. And he's got lots of friends and family all following his trip on the blog. And they just thought it couldn't be a better, you know, a better vacation for them and bonding and tragedy struck in this van that uh, he lost his life to. And he said in it, uh, and this is, um, this is the quote from him. He, he, he talked quite a bit about, um, the kids and, and said that, you know, they, little Alexander, he says, who's preparing for elementary school with the awareness that his life and family will no longer be the same. And then he says, when we think of little Aria, his daughter, who doesn't have that horrible scene in her eyes, but will never know her dad, he goes on. And, and as we feel into this tragedy and we relate to a child that will now grow up fatherless. We all, you know, understand family and, and that kind of loss and can imagine it. And that's where compassion arises is when we actually feel into what it is that they are going through. We experience it on a, on a level where it moves us to feel a part of that human, of, of that human family. I feel closer to him. I feel closer to his children and those who are suffering as a result of his mm -hmm. death. And, and I'm moved and compassion arises. So it's that, um, you know, it generates that feeling of, of interconnectedness, but, you know, we've got to be willing to sort of go there just in, in direct sort of <laughs> contrast to the Charlottesville event where we got little compassion from you know, our president. And mm -hmm. it was, it was such a stark, uh, sort of so clear from one week to the next where one left you feeling cold and sort of uh, dangling out there, you know, looking to, for leadership to sort of, uh, you know, comfort you and feel that, that they will lead you in a direction toward sympathy, you know, toward care and in the Darwinian sense. And another example where you felt right away involved in the situation and felt um, compassion arise. So for me, it was so clear in those instances. Well, also, if you, if you saw the, uh, the newscasts of uh, the Spanish royalty visiting the hospital where the, uh, where the victims were being treated, and you could just, you could see the compassion in their eyes and just the way in which their bodies were held, that they were there, you know, to bear witness of what had happened and to offer whatever comfort and succor they could. Mm, bearing witness, beautiful uh, way to put it, right? We all can understand that. Dorothy, we're already at our first break. So listeners, we're going to go to a break and we'll be right back. And we're going to continue this conversation on compassion. We'll be right back. Awareness is universal. Establishing a living awareness through meditation brings peaceful, healthy, and creative well-being into your everyday life. The practice of living awareness, Spirit Fire's own meditation practice, is built on this belief and is designed for every level of practitioner. Each year, Spirit Fire hosts living awareness meditation retreats that allow you to explore the practice in depth at our retreat center in beautiful western Massachusetts. Introduce yourself to meditation and the practice at the Foundations Retreat. Attend, in silence, a silent meditation retreat focused on mindfulness, presence, and nature. Or be engaged with the meditation sittings themselves at the Deepening Retreat. Start adding to your awareness and attend a meditation retreat designed to cultivate consciousness in your everyday life. For details on attending a Living Awareness Meditation Retreat, visit upcoming events at www.spiritfire.com. What if your body and mind were the compasses to the secrets, mysteries, and magic of life? 
Glenna Rice, co-host of The Questionable Parent, is inviting you to access all that is possible. Glenna is a 10-year certified veteran access consciousness facilitator who offers an amazing variety of life-changing classes and workshops. Work with Glenna from anywhere with teleclasses and workshops all over the globe. To learn more and see Glenna's current schedule of events, classes, and workshops, visit GlennaRice.com. Do you want to heal your body and mind? Your body has a lot to tell you if you just learn to listen to your intuition. Audrey Michelle, host of Rewired Life Radio, can help you peel away the layers that are holding you back from living your best life. Tune in to Rewired Life Radio. Learn to love, heal, celebrate on Transformation Talk Radio every Wednesday at 12 p.m. Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern. Connect with Audrey at AudreyMichelle.com. Calling all moms, it's time to awaken your vibrant, intuitive, loving self in every area of your life. Join host Debbie Pokornik as she shares thoughts, stories, and tools to help you stand in your power. Listen to Vibrant Powerful Moms Helping Everyday Women Create Extraordinary Lives, Mondays at 2.30 Pacific, 5.30 Eastern. For more information about Debbie, visit EmpoweringEnergy.com. That's Empowering with letters N-R-G.com. Discover the healing medicine from the giant monkey tree frog, Cambo. Cambo practitioner Ginny Rutherford and professional psychic Todd Rolson have come together for lively discussions of alternative healing medicines from the Amazon. Ginny and Todd bring you Cambo Talk Radio. Tune in each Monday at 1 p.m. Pacific to hear from guests all over the world with real life stories and the medicinal benefits of Cambo. For more information, visit CamboKiss.com. Hello, listeners. Welcome back to Spirit Fire Radio. We're so glad you're joining us for this conversation on compassion. It couldn't be more apropos these days. Just before the break, we were talking a bit about the events of the last several weeks, which have had us all, uh, I'm sure on some level, feeling the pain of another and being moved uh, to want to help even if it's energetically. And well, before the before the uh, break, I was just talking about feelings arising as I heard a tribute to somebody who lost their lives in Barcelona. And that feeling of compassion, it it really, it arises quite naturally. You know, it's it's when it's missing, <laughs> it, it feels quite strange. You know, you, 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 for me anyway, I sure certainly could only speak to myself, but residing in the heart, uh, you know, it, it feels warm. It feels, uh, it just feels natural. And I know Dorothy, you have, um, said time and again that, that this is within us, right? This is an instinct. So it should feel natural to us. Absolutely. The, uh, what the psychological research shows is uh, with young babies and also with chimpanzees, the two species where they've done work, is that, that they will engage in spontaneous, helpful behavior, even if they have to overcome obstacles to do so. And in infants, uh, the, you know, they've done some, some brain scan type studies and the infants show a positive response both when they help and when they see someone being helped. So the, the whole dynamic of helping is, uh, arouses this very positive uh, feeling, joyous feeling, we might say, within them. So it's interesting to me, Steve, that we, we often talk about how we need to develop compassion. I don't think we need to develop compassion. I think we need to remember compassion yes, and reconnect with that uh, very basic instinct that is in us, but so often gets uh, unlearned and kind of beaten out of us because yeah. of role models that we see that are not compassionate. And, and society and culture, we've said it time and again in, in right speech and right action, Dorothy, right? We, we were saying, just pay attention to the world around you. When we talked about harmlessness, we said there are often very few examples of harmlessness as compared to examples of violence and harm and tragedy and drama that we see in our culture all around us. So, and kids are exposed to this 
goodness, so much more today than they were at least when I was growing up. Uh, the internet and television has really sort of lowered the bar, I find, on on what what would support that which would support interconnection and mm -hmm. compassion. So it's sort of like we think, you know, parents have to or have to teach their kids to be racists or to be, you know, to be prejudiced in some way. But I, I don't know. You know, I think I think uh, the environment around us supports that. It's almost um, parents have to teach our kids how not to be <laughs> or at least keep an environment, um, allow for an environment that reminds them of that innate nature and supports it and allows it to grow. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting if you think about the news. An act of compassion becomes newsworthy because it seems unusual. Whereas we would hope that we would come to the stage where an act of violence or prejudice or hatred would be the the unusual and would would call for commentary and condemnation. Uh, but that's not where we are right now. And you had mentioned to me uh, once when we were talking, Steve, uh, something about the thymus gland. I had never heard of this before. <laughs> Indeed. Well, as, as we were talking about uh, sort of unlearning or, or forgetting this interconnectedness, it made me think of the thymus gland. Those of you who know the anatomy, uh, the physical anatomy, or even the energetic anatomy, the thymus gland is ruled by the heart center. And the heart center rules the immune system. And the thymus gland is very active in the immune system. It actually builds your immune system when you are um, a child and a young teenager. It really sets your body up for the future. And you think about your immune system, right? It's about everything being in a state of homeostasis, which means balance, which means everything's getting along. There's no wars or battle go battles going on inside your body. Well, it's quite interesting that in the average human being actually it is beyond the average. It is at almost 100%. The thymus gland becomes atrophied as we reach our 20s. And isn't it interesting? That's about the same age when we strike out on our own. We become individuals, right? I am my own person and we develop our personality. And then within that, we can have a tendency to forget that we're part of a larger group because we're so firm in establishing our independence that we forget our interdependence. And as a result, this gland completely atrophies. It does not work. And the, you know, the esotericists and the uh, ageless wisdom says that one day when we don't forget our interconnectedness, when we actually evolve to a place where we're not uh, working through this, this independence, but actually it is a vehicle, the independence is a vehicle for actually an expression of the greater group that our thymus gland will stay intact. It'll work through our whole lives. So <laughs> it'll be interesting to see. Well, and, and to me, it's interesting having been trained as a psychologist uh, within traditional psychology, uh, becoming developing autonomy, becoming independent is like the peak of what you aim for. And yet, to me, what I have learned and recognized is that it's just one stage along the journey towards remembering that we are part of the one life. We are part of one uh, giant cosmic energy field. We are all one. Right. And, you know, that it's, that is it, the, the prior, what you were talking about, this, this pinnacle, you know, of independence that can get in the way with compassion. Correct. I mean, when we view ourselves mm -hmm. as totally separate from another, when, when we, when, in order to feel compassion, we've got to connect and we've got to actually tap into another person's pain, even if only for a moment. And if we're protective, if we don't want to feel pain, you know, if, or if we feel anger or resentment towards another person's suffering, that's so unjust what happened to them. And we can't get beyond that mm -hmm. because we have our own thoughts about it, our own ideas around this event. We're actually not connecting on a heart level. You know, we're con not connecting from a place of interconnectivity and interdependence. So that person may need me and I can understand where I can put myself in their place. And so it's very important. And uh, that's sort of, um, you know, um, emotional, you know, the capacity to sort of explore our emotions is a big part of this too. Yes, and, and I think it's important to keep in mind that 
when we separate ourselves from another uh, or from a whole group of others, what we're doing is we're creating this illusion of duality. Uh, and as soon as we create two groups, we seem to automatically see one group as better than the other. And of course, the group that we're in, or we ourselves, are the ones that tend to be, quote, better. And then we feel pity or judgment on uh, that other group. And so the separation between self and others is inherently toxic. It brings about dynamics that are very damaging. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and not to <laughs> once again go back to the state of the nation or the state of the world, but you know that was what happened after this tragedy that happened here in the states, and we all wanted to come together. I feel as 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 a one humanity, and it was it was immediately turned into this dual situation of one versus another, instead of sort of rising above and saying, "Well, wow." Let's look at what's happening here, and mm -hmm. criticism, right, Dorothy? I mean, why? Yes. We've we can't we can't go without talking about criticism when we talk about falling into the trap of duality and one versus another, uh, because it, it it that's it. You know, it just it begets separation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and and I think the you know, the whole dynamic of criticism. Uh, it's it's easy to think that <laughs> we're doing somebody else a favor by pointing out their shortcomings. You know, we're helping them along. And yet, unless somebody has actually asked for feedback or we are in a position where it is our responsibility to provide feedback, we really have absolutely no business uh, commenting on somebody else's life. They, we have no idea the path that they're walking. We have no idea the the sole purpose that they're trying to achieve, the struggle, the struggles that they're going through. We need to just focus on doing our own part, uh, keeping uh, keeping our own compassion intact instead of focusing on somebody else. Absolutely, until we can focus on them. Without, okay. right, without the pity and without the criticism or the judgment, when we can focus on them from the place, yeah, of of the heart, right. takes. And in fact, in the in some of the metaphysical teachings, um, what is said is that criticism is the worst characteristic. It's the most damaging uh, characteristics because of its separative nature. And that what we need to be doing from a spiritual perspective is supporting the other in living their truth in the way that makes sense to them. Now, that's assuming that they aren't harming other people, but that's, that's what, uh, what we're really called to do. Well, may it be so, Dorothy Wright. May it be so. Mm -hmm. We're... We're at another break. We will be right back after these messages. Tune in to Lucid Planet Radio with Dr. Kelly Neff. This hit show will illuminate your senses and empower you beyond your daily stressors and hardships. Renowned psychologist and author Dr. Kelly will captivate you with far-reaching topics and amazing guests as you wake to the greatest version of yourself. Learn to tap into your intuitions, think critically about our world, heal emotional and psychological wounds, and follow your passions to live your dreams. The Lucid Planet, welcome home. Visit lucidplanetradio.com for more information. Hi there, my name is Audrey Michelle, host of Rewired Life Radio and a spiritual growth coach. I talk about this all the time on my show, listening to your body and acting on intuition. What do these things even mean? Here's the thing, about 10 years ago, I figured out I was doing it all wrong. I mean, I wasn't unhappy, but was I really happy? And then life sent me a spiritual smackdown, like it does, because I wasn't listening to my best resource, my body and my intuition. I was living from a place of fear. I was stressed and I was in pain, and I seemed to be happily unhappy. Mostly I just didn't know what I didn't know. 
And what I didn't know was that my body and my intuition had all the tools I needed to live life as my best self. I'm sharing the tools I have learned over the last 10 years of my healing journey in my online class, Soul Awakening, beginning September 19th. Learn more. Go to AudreyMichelle.com slash awaken. That's Audrey Michelle spelled M-I-C-H-E-L dot com slash awaken. Gain powerful insight and practical tools to support you on your spiritual journey. Access your higher self and tune in every second and fourth Thursday at 12 p.m. Pacific to A Life Untethered with Andrew Martin, walking the path of freedom. Andrew is a highly attuned intuitive oracle, energy worker, spiritual teacher, and international radio host. For more about Andrew and his services, visit thelightedones.com. Known for his keen sense of humor, contagious smile, and extensive esoteric wisdom, EJ translates deep spiritual wisdom into practical advice to empower you to live your happiest, most fulfilled experience. Mystic Living Radio, Deep Spiritual Wisdom, Practical Advice with EJ, Eliyahu Jihan. This hit show delivers profound experiences for all who want to live life to their deepest desires. Tune in monthly for Mystic Living Radio. Learn more by visiting vitaltransformation.org. Thrive is what we experience when our mind, body, and soul operate as one. When we thrive, we excel on all levels. Thrive is the mindset that matters. It is essential to our being. Have you ever found yourself looking for the instruction manual on how to thrive? You'll find everything you need to help you feel strong, powerful, and peaceful in your own body. So don't waste any more time. Visit thrivebygen.com today. Welcome, listeners, back to Spirit Fire Radio. This is Dorothy Riddle uh, with the School for Esoteric Studies and Steve Kramer with Spirit Fire. And we are talking today about compassion and why it is so difficult. And, Steve, I just wanted to comment that one of the challenges, and, and I don't say this lightly because I think it's really difficult, uh, one of the challenges in be, being compassionate is to not confuse the person with their actions or beliefs. Because we say things like, he's a white supremacist. Well, he's himself, and he happens to espouse a belief which is white, white supremacy. It's the same thing as uh, you don't say, it's not helpful to say he's a drunk driver. He, instead, we would say he is someone who drove while he was drunk. Um, do you understand the distinction I'm trying to make there? I do understand the distinction, and I think it is uh, it is wise. <laughs> There's much wisdom in that, right? I mean, what it does is it it is compassion, right? That is a compassionate way of viewing an individual, and it basically gives them the freedom to choose other, to, to, to see the air or take responsibility for their actions because they are an individual. You are at least giving them that freedom, right? Mm -hmm. And in a sense, they have chosen that which we would not consider to be, um, beneficial or helpful or positive or, uh, you know, uh, to be helpful, really. I, I, what's the word I want to say? But uh, there are consequences to the actions or consequences to choices mm -hmm. or consequences mm -hmm. that, that that sort of belief leads one to. But you're, you're giving them an individuality. You're giving them the freedom to take responsibility is sort of how I see it. Is that how you see it? Yeah, but also you're giving them the space to be, you know, to yeah. uh, to think, to grow, to change, to decide. Um, and I don't know about you, but if somebody puts a label on me, I immediately get defensive. My ability to change just goes right down to zero. Right. Uh, because all right. I'm doing is defending my right to hold that belief. Whereas if somebody sees it as uh, a belief that I have that they may or may not agree with, as opposed to me, who I am, 
then I have space to to step back and consider the ramifications to listen uh, all of that I feel like some like I'm being seen and heard by someone else in fact there's a, there's this um uh, Term that I just love uh, from uh, from a book called "Hearing the Other into Existence," mm. and I think the I think the author is uh, Nellie Morton, but I won't don't hold me to that because uh, it the book is called uh, "The Journey Is Home." It's a beautiful mm. book, but that we become we become ourselves and we come to understand our experience by being able to verbalize it and share it. I mean, you yourself have said, I mean, one of the things about speech is that it puts thoughts, it closes thoughts in a way so that they can be shared. Uh, we and need not only space shared, in but, which to do that. but examined. And exactly. One of the most moving things of, of the last couple of weeks was, the mini documentary or news piece from HBO's Vice News, where we really got a close up look at the people who were protesting in Charlottesville. And this young woman was so compassionate. She wasn't acting to help these individuals, but as a reporter, she was giving them space without judgment and without criticism. Now, she was not letting them off the hook, and she was just simply asking questions. And it was clear in some of her questions that it was not where she, the way she would answer it or where she was coming from. In fact, she was downright confused by some of what they were saying, and she was asking, would you please – I don't <laughs> explain that. That's not making sense to me. And they would explain it as best they could in the way it made sense to them. And when you then hear their truth and see their belief systems, then there it is. It is out there and it is a topic. We can then discuss it because it has been put into form, right? We can, we can, mm -hmm. we can walk around it as if it were a table and take a look at it from all sides. And it really helps. And, and I thought that in a sense, she was hearing them, as you're saying, you know, she was allowing them to speak in a way that wasn't pointing a finger or criticizing. And it was quite compassionate and very revealing. Very revealing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it just comes down to fear. I just think of fear so much. You know, what you realize with is you give these individuals space and, and some of these people um, that I have heard, what it comes down to is a lot of them are very angry. A lot of them are very um, fearful is what it comes down to that they, they're, they, they're fear, they're fearful of, of losing in the case of the white supremacist, quite literally fearful of losing white mm -hmm. privilege and a feeling they will be quote unquote replaced. Right. And it comes down to fear. And the bottom line is, we've said it before, we're born with two fears, the fear of loud noises and the fear of falling. As infants, a loud noise or being on the edge of something that we might fall will scare us into retreat. Other than that, fear is learned. And so we have learned. It, it, these are ideas and these are oftentimes illusions, which is, you know, it's a thought form that actually doesn't hold much truth. It has been created and, and held by being repeated again and again. Mm -hmm. And until we take a look at those and we hear them out and we undo this fear and people, uh, you know, we, we rationalize that actually you have nothing to fear. And if we can find it in our hearts to make some connection, then we quell the fear and somehow we hope to get uh, us all on the same page, right? Yes, and I think one of the illusory concepts that we need to name is that life is a zero-sum game. You know, so yeah. if you're doing well, then I will necessarily lose out, and that that then uh, fuels the kinds of fears that we've been talking about. And that's not that's not the way the world operates. The world. The world is constructed to be abundant. If, if you think about uh, just the species in the world, there are so many, many, many different species. Of course, as humans, we're busily killing off some of them. <laughs> but it's like uh, the Earth didn't just say, just you know, okay, so I'm going to have one animal with four legs, and I'm going to have one with two legs, and I'm going to have one type of plant. No, no, no. Lots of experimentation, lots of different possibilities, uh, lots of abundance. And if we really understand that, uh, that life is abundant, if we can feel into that, then we can let go of that fear 
and we can let go of that criticism and we can feel our way into compassion. Mm. Beautifully said, beautifully said, indeed. So this brings us to forgiveness. Yes, that that left me that left me silent, Dorothy. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you just said it all right there, huh? <laughs> forgiveness. So if, I mean, there you gonna go. Not, go on, Dorothy. Sorry. Uh, so if we're going to be compassionate and not be critical, then the uh, the the feeling that we have to have within ourselves is generated first by being able to forgive ourselves, right? Because c- compassion is grounded in the fact that we have a shared human experience. And part of that human experience is that we experiment in ways that don't work out as much as we experiment in ways that do work out. And when we make what we feel is an error or a mistake, uh, we have to be able to... Uh, to forgive ourselves, to to look at ourselves with compassion, because how we treat ourselves is how we're going to treat other people. Yes, we talked about that quite a bit in the first in the in the first talk on compassion, and it it just goes back and forth, Dorothy. Right? Because imagine if you are surrounded by criticism, 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 criticism. Good luck trying to forgive yourself. <laughs> you know, mm. I mean. It, it really has to go both ways. We've really got to create an environment that supports support and that supports sympathy and that mm-hmm. supports, you know, quite literally just this idea that, that we all make mistakes. We, we, we have flaws, you know, but we, we can grow. We can grow out of them mm-hmm. indeed. It makes me think forgiveness was uh, so key to that the outcome of the Charleston shooter, Dylan Roof, uh, who took the lives of the congregation in Charleston at the church. And just remember the, the woman who was a relative of the victim who basically told Dylan Roof, I forgive you. You know, she said, you took something very precious from me and you'll never see my loved ones again. I'll never hold them, but I forgive you. And I have mercy on your soul. And boy, oh boy, it resonated. I was actually in South Carolina. I've got quite a bit of family in South Carolina. And I was there uh, with my partner when that happened. And my relatives were so moved. And there was just a vibration, a vibrational shift happened with that forgiveness that I feel resonated throughout the South. And it has permeated. It has stayed. Some of my relatives, goodness gracious, there are some things that they've said that I've just gone, oh, have mercy on your souls. Please, you know, take a look at what you just said, who have in the many last many years really come around to just be some of the most genuine, um, compassionate human beings. And there are just these shifts I find happening in the South. And despite what we saw happening in a couple, a couple of weeks ago, uh, you know, that, that act of forgiveness and that statement of someone taking a relative's life and saying, you know what, I forgive you because I won't, uh, you know, I see you as human and I have mercy on your soul. It creates huge vibrational shifts and we cannot underestimate the power of forgiveness. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Dorothy, we're at another break. Uh, let's okay. let's uh, continue the conversation. We'll be right back. Awareness is universal. Establishing a living awareness through meditation brings peaceful, healthy, and creative well-being into your everyday life. The practice of living awareness, Spirit Fire's own meditation practice, is built on this belief and is designed for every level of practitioner. Each year, Spirit Fire hosts living awareness meditation retreats that allow you to explore the practice in depth at our retreat center in beautiful western Massachusetts. Introduce yourself to meditation and the practice at the Foundations Retreat. Attend, in silence, a silent meditation retreat focused on mindfulness, presence, and nature. Or be engaged with the meditation sittings themselves at the Deepening Retreat. 
Start adding to your awareness and attend a meditation retreat designed to cultivate consciousness in your everyday life. For details on attending a Living Awareness Meditation Retreat, visit upcoming events at www.spiritfire.com. What is a brilliant culture and how do we create them? Why are they important? Claudette Rowley has created a breakthrough five-step process to help you align your culture with your business strategy for exceptional results. Looking for a culture that drives organizational excellence? Listen to Cultural Brilliance Radio, the second and fourth Friday of each month at 10 a.m. Pacific and 1 p.m. Eastern on Transformation Talk Radio. To learn more or work with Claudette, visit culturalbrilliance.com. How would you like increased health and vitality? How would you like to avoid the onset of disease as well as slow the aging process? This is all possible through a simple, safe, and natural process. Every day we are either moving toward wellness or away from wellness. Hi, I'm Mary Jane Mack. I'd like to be your partner in achieving optimal health. Contact me now at MaryJaneMack.com or call 425-392-0659. Visit MaryJaneMack.com. Now you can be a part of one of the most powerful programs to help create a more joyful, loving, abundant, and peaceful world. Every day at 12 noon in any time zone, join millions of other people around the world to spend a few minutes in joy, love, and gratitude. Brought to you by Robert Schoenfeld, host of the Art of Powerful Living Radio. Together, we can raise the vibration of the planet. For more information, visit globalmomentofjoy.com. Tune in to the Psychic Professors Show, The Voices of Spirit Radio, with international medium and spirit artist Dr. Susan Barnes on Transformation Talk Radio. Featuring a variety of spiritual topics such as psychic art, spiritualism, EVP, psychic development, and mediumship. This hit call-in show provides listeners with breakthrough wisdom to enliven and enlighten their lives. Visit spiritartgallery.net. Tune in each Friday, 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern on Transformation Talk Radio. Welcome back to Spirit Fire Radio. It's a delight to be with you talking about such an important topic, compassion, just an important component of the spiritual path and the human path. Just before the break, we were talking about forgiveness, and I just want to bring that up again. I was talking about uh, the Charleston shooter and relatives of the victim saying they forgave him. And I just want to be clear that, you know, within that, within that, forgiveness within that um, mercy was not letting him off the hook that that forgiveness is is not a pardon it wasn't saying that this is okay or i understand but it was that i am giving you it is forgiveness i am giving you the space you know i am giving you um my heart in, in that I see what you did and I have mercy on your soul that you may learn or make other choices, but certainly not about, uh, about pardoning, right? Or forgetting, really. As the South didn't, that started the big move to take the Confederate flag down on the state grounds of South Carolina. So and certainly it led to actions and wasn't just forgive and forget, right, Dorothy? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and... You shared that experience about the Charleston shooter. I'd like to share an experience of my mother, which really uh, both touched and uh, uh, shaped me in a certain way. Um, When she was in her early or mid-50s, she and my father were living in New York City in Manhattan. Uh, They were on the... uh, kind of upper part of the east side near one of the parks. And she uh, went to church on a Sunday morning, and she was coming back home just before noon, uh, walking down the street, and a man jumped out of the bushes, grabbed her with a knife to her throat, and raped her, and uh, then fled. He was never caught. Uh, and when she related that story, what she said was the whole time it was happening, what she was thinking to herself 
was two things. One is, I forgive you. And the second is, I will not allow you and this action to turn me towards hatred. Hmm. And I just try and, you know, thinking my way into that experience of being held with a knife across your throat, you know, being violated, and instead of, of being consumed by fear or rage or any of those, to be thinking, I forgive you, and I will not allow this experience to move me to hate. Wow, to it stay was, was, intact, right, through yeah. that. Yeah, it was, it was a very uh, poignant experience to me. Well, and, and was that the case? And, and you, it, yes, it sounds yes. so. Yeah, she, um, she didn't speak about the experience very often. She did when it was appropriate. Um, but she lived her life in joy. Really, she's mm-hmm. one of the most joyous people that I knew, and she did not let that experience change that for her. Um, she continued to be uh, very curious about other people's experience, very interested, very supportive, very compassionate towards other people. Well, we, we've yeah, we've we've spent a lot of time talking about the negative that it's such a it's such a fresh. It feels so fresh to hear you say uh, joy, you know, and curiosity and that sense of wonder in the human experience that you could even. You could even keep that intact and and have that to some capacity. Certainly not joy, but this idea of 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 being open, you know, to an alternative that not to to go the default uh, and say this you know, this will not ruin ruin me, you know. Mm-hmm. One very strong indeed. Well, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. judgment, right? Uh, yeah. Not passing judgment. I know we we wanted to bring up judgment a bit, and and that's right there throughout that story, right? Uh, mm-hmm. To be able to not judge within that circumstance is very powerful, indeed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the I think it's important to recognize that uh, we don't just judge by saying something that sounds. Uh, you know, heavy-handed or authoritarian. We also judge by being dismissive, by minimizing uh, the suffering of someone else, you know, by saying, oh, it's not that serious, you know, um, you've, or even, you know, you're the one that's created the problem, you know. Um, And I know, like, I myself have been... uh, (laughs) On the other end of this, the in preparation for having some surgery that uh, people keep reassuring assuring me is very minor. It'll be nothing. You don't have to worry about it. By saying those things to me when I have just said to them, I'm nervous about this, uh, is very demeaning, actually. It's not, I think people think that it will be helpful, but it's not. Mm. It's dismissive of my actual emotional experience. Yeah, instead of uh, saying, you know, is there anything I could do, you know, what could I say to make you feel better or or I'm sorry you are in that, uh, I'm sorry you're feeling that way or, yeah. Right. Or, or just, is there anything I can do to support you? Right. You know, which would right. be the compassionate thing to say. Yeah, yeah sort of sets us up again, right? We, we move mm-hmm. to the opposite, thinking that we're going to balance it somehow, right? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There was one, one thing I wanted to mention about uh, judgment as we were talking about judgment and for listeners who, uh, you know, judgment creeps up. You know, if you ask yourself, and criticism, we think about criticism as well. If you could start your day and simply say, I'm going to watch my mind and I'm going to see mm-hmm. how many times judgment or criticism, you know, comes up. And, and 
really observe that and you will be surprised. Even our own self-talk and self-criticism, self-judgment. It's a really wonderful exercise, you know, uh, between now and next week, uh, you know, to see if you can create some space um, between the times you might be critical of another or in judgment. And it, it can creep in in ways that you might not at first label as being judgmental, just as in that instance of people's responses to um, your being nervous about about the surgery, you might not see that actually that's not so supportive. It's actually contradicting something somebody just said. Uh, and so to watch for that, you know, within a meditation practice, almost every meditation practice begins with with struggle, with struggling with the mind. And we will inevitably judge, you know, why why can't I stop thinking? Why can't I quiet my mind? Why do these emotions arise? Why am I so uncomfortable? Most people don't want to meditate because there's so much resistance that comes up. But, you know, we've really got to not only in meditation, but in life. We've got to go to those places which make us uncomfortable sometimes and cozy up. You know, that's how we change the story. We've got to face that which we resist and and ponder its qualities, ponder its essence. And, you know, we realize that what we resist, it will persist. That saying is is quite truthful. So, you know, study it in, within yourself. You know, the, the whole first half of our meditation practice is a shamatha practice. It's quite literally a peaceful, abiding practice because until we can learn to sit peacefully with ourselves, we really cannot approach someone else uh, with a peaceful demeanor and balance and non-judgment, non a non-judgmental attitude, which means coming from the heart, which is compassion. So, Dorothy, so we have well, a minute left. Anything, anything you'd like to add before we go? Well, I just want to, I just want to bring us back to the beginning, which is was the widening our circle of compassion, and I think, just as you were saying, you know, watch your mind, watch your, watch your judgments. I would encourage people as you go out through your life, pick a, pick a time each day when you watch how wide your awareness is. Are you focused only on the people that you know? Um, do you welcome into your awareness other people, other experiences, other species? You know, how are you in the world? Mm. What is the circumference of your awareness? Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Well, Dorothy, it was a very rich conversation. I look forward to continuing it next week. We're going to talk about ways to generate uh, compassion. So I look forward to that and we'll be wrapping it up. So strengthening compassion listeners, I hope you join us next week. It's been great, Dorothy. Thank you so much. Thanks to you too, Steve. All right. I'll see you next week. Thank you for listening to Spirit Fire Radio. Tune in each Wednesday at 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 noon Eastern for your weekly guide to purposeful living in practical spirituality. Join hosts Steve Kramer and Dorothy Riddle as they shine the light on universal spiritual principles and uncover ways that ageless wisdom can guide you in cultivating consciousness in your everyday life. Add to your awareness with Spirit Fire Radio. To learn more, visit spiritfireradio.com. 